This is a story of a 2,000 mile race around the British Isles, much of it in gales and heavy weather. Welcome to the 1998 Royal Western Yacht Club Round Britain and Ireland race. You will be joining Peter Clutterbuck and Brian Thompson on their 43 foot Grand Prix trimaran, Spirit of England. The course leaves all islands of the British Isles to starboard, excepting Rockall and the Channel Isles, with a 48-hour compulsory stopover for each boat at each port. The first leg is from Plymouth across the Irish Sea to Crosshaven. The next leg is past the infamous Fastnet Rock, then into the Atlantic and northwards to the Outer Hebrides. Gales and storms are often a feature. Leg 3 is from Barra, out into the Atlantic again, to leave St Kilda and several uninhabited rocks to starboard, then north towards the Arctic Circle, past Michael Flagger at 61 degrees north, to Lowick in the Shetlands. Leg 4 goes through the oil and gas platforms of the North Sea, back to warmer latitudes at Lowestoft. The final leg, number 5, negotiates the tides of the Dover Straits and the dense shipping of the Channel back to Plymouth. The rough seas and heavy weather of the Atlantic constitute the main challenge, and much of the coastline is a hazardous lee shore, especially the west coast of Ireland. Most of the coastline is sparsely inhabited, with very little in the way of facilities, so many of the boats have shore support teams to provide repair services at the stopovers. The distance sailed is often more than from Southampton to New York, and thorough planning, practice and preparation are essential. The remote islands off Scotland are rarely visited and provide majestic scenery. The North Sea has hundreds of platforms and its own reputation for bad weather. A thousand ships a day ply the English Channel and form a hazard of their own. Past winners of this race read like a who's who of ocean racing. Sir Robin Knox Johnston, first man to sail single-handed round the world non-stop. Sir Shea Blythe, pictured here with the late Rob James, who rode the Atlantic then became the first man to circumnavigate non-stop east to west. Tony Bullimore, famous for surviving five days inside the upturned hull of his Open 60 off Antarctica, and Steve Fawcett sailing the 60-foot tri Lakota, pictured here with Richard Branson on a combined record-breaking ballooning project. Tony Bullimore's apricot was the last British boat to win in 1986, when he was elected Yachtsman of the Year. Steve Fawcett now campaigns Sony PlayStation, the world's fastest offshore sailing boat with Brian Thompson as watch captain and my good friends Peter Hogg and David Scully as crew. Ian Johnston and Cathy Hawkins inspired me to do this race following their heroic recovery from a pitch pole in the Atlantic. Cathy axed a hole in the cabin to let Ian out. Here is the competition, Brian and myself on spirit. FPC Greenaway well sorted after six Atlantic crossings driven by Richard Tolkien and Robert Wingate. Shockwave driven by American Ralph Marks and Alistair Wood. Nigel Musto, son of Olympic medalist Keith Musto, and Andy Hindley, ex-BT Challenge skipper, on the Open 60 formerly campaigned by David Scully in the BOC, and Mark Gatehouse with Adam Littlejohn, sailing the Open 60 Victoria Docks, formerly BOC winner skater Calberson. Let's take the last bit through away. If that lashing will be strong enough to support the last bit. The load, if it goes into a wave, then the, the load would be taken by the um, homestay. Yeah. Merv Owen, Spirit's designer, plans extensive modifications to Spirit. Alan Clark project manages the construction, and Bill Bullimore the new sails. A light air headsail and a VMG reacher, built by Tom McWilliam and John Brinkers in the UK McWilliam loft. These sails are revolutionary in concept. There is no shed on the south coast big enough for spirit, 
so Allen and Richard Utley built one to cover Spirit's bows and later sterns. The boat was lengthened three feet as the race rules allowed multi-hulls up to 45 feet. The bows were made sharper and the stern exits cleaner and the new carbon-built bowsprit was constructed. Stowage lists and provisions are finalized, logistics plans distributed for the two shore support teams. After five years of preparation, we're at Queen Anne's Battery, Plymouth. Fellow competitor Ellen MacArthur is inspecting spirit, now touted as the race favorite. My son Michael finds the trampoline nets the best place for playing with his cousin Rachel. Brian does a final underwater inspection. Ready to go. I was going to ask you about the speedo. Yeah, it was working. Yeah. It ticked over. Good. Yeah. There's this much gap. And, uh, the, the forecast pulled up off the internet is not so good. A deep low with a force six beat and then a run before a gale to Ireland. The main is hoisted and the rig checked one final time. 38 lines are controlled by 38 clutches and four winches on a complex rig race hardened over the five seasons in the Atlantic and high latitudes. We head for the start. Two reefs in the main and staysail ready to hoist. The multi-hull fleet assembles, 15 of them, reef down ready for the wild conditions outside. There are 41 starters from seven countries. The monohulls are nearest the naval warship from where the starting cannon was fired. Ellen MacArthur on Jeantex, double reefed with staysail, mizzen stowed. Musto, triple reefed with a tiny storm staysail, well heeled without her water ballast fully loaded up. Victoria docks, also heeled over, while Mark and Adam start loading the ballast tanks. Two multi-hulls in the background retire already with breakages. Greenaway tacks on to port. On spirit, we beat out past Eddystone and take the lead by the Scilly Isles.
across the Irish Sea. 4-6 and fairly bouncy and several of the trimarans had to retire with damage. We had a great sail across to Crosshaven here. We were doing about um, 22 knots maximum and I think we did 132 miles in uh, 9 hours which is 16-17 knots average so we were very pleased with that. And the boat behaved itself beautifully. We were able to drive the bows into the seas and they'd pop back out again without slowing down too much. We caught some nice big waves and we surfed them. And in fact, had to accelerate over the wave in front, catch, catch the one in front as well, and then another one. So it was interesting helming. And Brian did nearly all the work. He um, is a fantastic uh, sailor. The media was very complimentary to us, but we had work to do, repairing the rudder, and the next leg promised to be quite horrendous. Brian brought me the weather facts, saying, are you ready for this? A full Atlantic gale was building, and we would have to beat into it through the night. It would test us and the boat beyond our known limits as a gale warning for this leg. Uh, head seas uh, going around the fast net and around the southwest corner of Ireland. So we're going to try and keep the boat together and hold on to our lead, which is... Leaving for the start line, our friends wish us good luck as if we're going to war. Would spirit survive it? Would we lose our mast hammering into big Atlantic breakers? We start on a reach feeling the Atlantic swells coming in ahead of the gale. We have two reefs and staysail up. Greenaway is 40 minutes behind us and almost pitch poles into a big swell as a violent gust comes down. We keep the pressure on, wondering what lies ahead. Bill and Liam cross Ireland and catch the ferry up to Scotland, ready for any emergency. Bill has project managed Spirit for four years and knows the boat intimately.
was a very large low, which uh, came through here uh, a couple of days ago. And um, we were caught by the depression uh, off Ireland. Uh, and we had to beat into a gale, force 7, gusting force 8, overnight. It was a very rough night indeed. Uh, the boat did hold together though. And um, we uh, had three reefs in the main and staysail and some big seas, probably 25 foot or so. Um, like big uh, Devonshire hills with smaller seas on the back in front of them. And uh, then we had a rough, rough beat up the west coast of Ireland in very gloomy seas. And I haven't seen any other sailing boats at all, so we don't know where we are, but we hope we found the lead. Uh, this morning we were lucky, the wind came around behind us, and we're now doing uh, 15 knots or so towards the finish line at Barra. And uh, here it is. We're coming up here. The finish line is between these two boys here. And uh, we will then go into our mooring at Castle Bay. That here, one of the marvels of uh, Modern navigation, and it shows the track of the boat with the triangle there. We've been driving downwind towards the finish line at Barra, which is immediately north of the boat. Then, a near disaster. The toggle on the cap shroud has sheared, probably, probably in the gale. Probably be this way, but not quite so nice. race against time to get the new rigging manufactured in southern England and delivered to the Outer Hebrides within 48 hours over a weekend. The only airstrip in the area was the beach and could only be used at low water and not on Sundays. The ferry would be too slow, as would a fishing boat. A parachute drop into the bay would be illegal. There were no seaplanes or floatplanes. Bill went ahead and organized the whole project. Duncan Barr put the two new sets together and Richard Late brought them out, driving to Heathrow flying to Glasgow, then high-speed rib overnight into choppy seas with seasick crews. It was a fantastic 30-hour effort. He arrived at 02.30. We hauled the bed up the hotel fire escape so he could get some rest. Then we rebuilt the rig. Beautiful evening here. Just uh, left fire up, about 10 miles south, we're on the rounding the southern point of Bingley. Stop 
was at St Kilda now on a very bitterly cold morning. The sun just got up and it was a cold night with a uh, northerly wind we were beating into. Uh, what we're pressed up in here is uh, good for when the wind blows out of the Arctic. Uh, these are motorcycle motocross goggles, good for wet weather. And uh, diving gloves here. These are uh, fur lined for deep sea diving, completely waterproof. And they're excellent for high latitude sailing. And then uh, we have this excellent one piece uh, musto dry suit, which is completely waterproof again. And underneath that, lots of thermal underwear and mid layer clothing. And that way we can. Uh, keep you in with a minimal number of calories and uh, normally do one hour shifts at night and then longer shifts of three hours during the day. There is the Kilda, once inhabited by rugged islanders who collected birds. This is what we look at when we're driving Spirit of England. On the left is our apparent wind direction in the middle true wind speed and true wind angle. On the right, our compass heading. And in the instrument rack in front, on the left, another wind gauge. Middle left, true wind direction. Middle right, boat speed, and we're just drifting along here, four or five knots. And on the right, wind speed in knots. All the lines on the boat are controlled by banks of clutches. Uh, we have 38 of them on Spirit of England. A mast, mainsail, two spreaders, coming down to the base of the mast here, which is a rotating mast with a whole lot of blocks and tackles for controlling everything. And here are some of the lines going to the base of the mast. and hot dogs and um, open the can and uh, put it in the pot and mix it around. But uh, Peter suggested a better way, which is to uh, heat the cans in the pot. Beat up to the flannel islands. The light conditions suit us and allow us to extend our lead, which is now some six hours. Nine boats have retired with damage. Well, a very cold wind coming out of the Arctic. So uh, that explains why there's not too many people up on holiday around these parts. But it is the most beautiful area, and I've always wanted to see these islands. So here they are. It is now 20 minutes before midnight, and still light. The midnight sun helps us sail flat out 24 hours a day. The moon shimmers on the cold sea. Well, behind me is the uh, remote island of Sulaskia, out in the Atlantic all on its own. Another mark of the course. There it is, a remote crag. All the islands must be left to starboard. Brian catches some sleep in the bow cabin, where our instruments allow close monitoring of performance and the operation of the autopilot from down below. Our next mark is the Cape Horn of the British Isles, Muckle Flagger, at 61 degrees north. The weather is about to change. But there's a little tiny low uh, between us and Iceland, which um, is rotating counter to that. What's this? But uh, this low is going to stick around and move up towards Finland. So by the end of the leg, as we get closer to the shuttle lines, we should start to get some uh, better windows.
We pick up speed to 15 knots and nearly hit a waterlogged telegraph pole. Brian only avoided it thanks to the light from the midnight sun. It could have destroyed the boat. Brian overtook four killer whales. Then we crossed the finish line and into the sheltered waters of Lowick. We were both very fatigued. The boat had taken a terrific pounding and we were constantly trying to assess loads and sail the boat to its structural limits. We had a six hour lead over Musto and eight hours over FPC Greenaway and Victoria Docks. Our port float was cracked. There were no yacht facilities in the Shetlands. Alan Clark and Richard Late were now our shore support team and met us on the dock after two long ferry rides and a drive through the highlands with the Range Rover. We left our mark on Lowick with a bang. We were met on the dock by the same couple who had been hosts for Brian on his previous round Britain and they took all our soaked, salty and rust-stained clothes, laundered them and dried them in the fresh wind. We'd had another rigging failure, this time the Genoa Halyard Shackle. And uh, we were hitting some very big waves which had come from Norway, from a storm in Norway, which were coming the opposite direction, uh, from the northeast. And we were, I was on watch and Brian was down below and I was hitting some of these things so fast we were getting airborne over the top and landing with a tremendous crash into the trough. And I realized we were gonna break something pretty badly and uh, in fact we had a breakage up at the masthead. The sail had dropped to the deck, and we set the staysail instead. The, uh, the hardship has mainly been that the wind, wind has been much stronger than average for around uh, this, this time of year, year. and also the wrong direction, beating into it, and it's been quite incredibly cold. Uh, last night, for instance, uh, the wind was blowing uh, out of the north for a while, and um, straight out of the Arctic, and it was absolutely freezing. Uh, we, we try to get carbohydrates into our system one way or the other to keep fueling up. Uh, generally we sleep with all our foul weather gear on um, and about four layers of clothing underneath that. And I've got uh, diving gloves which you can go about 200 feet underwater with in, in the Arctic. And uh, we share those gloves and when we're on watch and off watch. And uh, they're fur lined with latex seals and we still have freezing hands inside those. As usual, there is a list of over 40 items to repair. Richard and Alan are both in the boat building trade and did a fantastic job. We were interviewed by the Daily Telegraph, The Guardian, Yachts and Yachting and the BBC, together with the local press and some internet publications. But again, our main worry is the weather. A trough and a cold front promise a tactical race and unbelievably, 
another beat all the way south through the North Sea, the last thing we needed. Additionally, we will be threading our way through the platforms to lower Stoft. We leave in light airs, but soon the wind is back, on the nose again. Now, a real problem that cost us five hours. Brian is up the mast, being badly beaten up, building a jury rig. Um, we had a major setback about three or four hours ago. We were doing about 15 knots towards the finish line, expecting to finish around sunset. And we actually still have about 80 miles to go to the finish line. Partly because the weather has gone quiet, but partly because there was a big bang. This is what happened here. Uh, big loud bang and boom! <laughs> Five tons and down comes the main, crashing down. Uh, we rigged up the mainsail on the spinnaker halyard and put in a half reef. But the halyard was going around the mast, which is not good for the mast or the halyard. And um, that worked for a while. And then we got the car, and Brian decided to go up and put a more permanent jury rig together. Hold up a, a block, attached it to the top of the mast, and we tensioned it up, uh, and it, it blew off again. Very common. Yeah, everything came crashing down onto the deck. And we had visions of all the competition sailing around the outside of us, around this hole, while we're spending the rest of our days here uh, fixing halyards. Uh, anyway, we think this flat weather is probably fairly uh, sensitive, so we were lucky that there was a, a hole in the wind, and uh, Brian went up a second time, and uh, put a more permanent fixture together, which is now holding the main slot. And then we went and had a look up the bottom of the mast to see where the problems were, took some pieces off the mast, and we found a real cat's cradle of lines in. We anxiously await the cold front to bring more wind. We nurse the boat through the gas platforms and across the finish line. The rig is seriously depowered on account of the jury rig, and we dare not overload it. We are still in the lead, but our margin has dropped.
Yeah. Okay, Roscoe, it'll be good and the leg go I was um, pretty tough leg in a way. Um, we really worked hard on it um, right from the beginning. And about three quarters of the way through, we had some equipment failure with the uh, main halyard breaking, which meant um, going for the mast a couple of times. And since then, it's really been non stop trying to catch up the time. And uh, we get in, and uh, yeah, right behind us is Musto, only an hour behind. So they caught up five hours. Yeah, yeah, so they, they sailed a really, really good race. And uh, we've got something to do now. Yeah, you kind of expect to have it because these are like racing cars and they're made very light and um, things do break and we have a lot of spares and tools on board and we also have a shore support team that meets us in each port and they're absolutely flat out during the 48 hours um, uh, repairing all the various damage things there's usually 20 to 50 things at each stopover that need fixing. And a crack on the side here, which is just a service crack outside. But there is now a structural repair on the inside, which keeps things keeps things held down that next leg for sure. And we're not the only ones with mass problems. Here's Ellen McCarter going up. On Dean Tex. This is Brian's jury rig, an amazing piece of work given the appalling conditions at the mast head. It had held up well, but only just. Alan is putting in the new halyard and rigged a spare as well. We lightened the boat, taking off heavy weather gear, cold weather clothing, downwind sails, warps and outboard replaced with a lighter one. The final leg would negotiate the tides of the Dover Straits. Uh, and must have only 200 miles to go to the finish. And the race is on. Just down there, you can see uh, what we believe is FPC Greenway. About, uh, probably seven or eight. You can hear the noise that goes on in a racing mountain helm in a rough sea. This is our bow cabin here. Shop full of sails, spare clothing, outboard motor. For a hundred miles, we are neck and neck down the channel, hammering into a Force 5, each boat sometimes airborne, taking off over the crests. Both boats are punished and driven to their limits. We arrived back in Plymouth after a wild approach on a pitch black night in a 4-7 squall with black rocks whizzing by, 36 minutes after Greenaway. We won our class. Richard and Robert won their class also and line on us. Musto came in six hours behind us, winning class one, then Gene Tex winning class two, and Shockwave class five. It had been a thrilling finale, an experience of a lifetime. Brian had sailed a fantastic race, driving hard in all conditions, and fixing the breakages with a cool head and buoyant humor. Our project team had also done a great job, a tribute to them, that the boat had held together during these grueling conditions. Of the 15 multi hulls that started, only seven finished. The others retired, scattered around the British Isles. From dismasting, broken rudder, broken daggerboard, outer hull ripped open, failed cap shrouds and other calamities. The survivors owed their good fortune to good preparation.